Hi, welcome to another ECNM Tech Talk. This one on separately derived systems. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to go to our code book and we're going to figure out what is a separately derived system. And then after we take a look at that, we're going to look at some of the practical applications. We'll look at transformers and automatic transfer switches. We'll probably talk a little bit about emergency power and so forth along the way. And then the next thing we want to get into is the code rules. So the NEC rules for separately derived systems. So let's go ahead and get started. First of all, let's take a look at the definition for a separately derived system. I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. And we take a look. The definition is found in Article 100. Separately derived system. An electrical power supply output other than a service having no direct connection to circuit conductors of any other electrical source other than those established by grounding and bonding connections. Well, that's our official definition, so let's talk a little bit about it. First of all, the whole concept, well, in fact, let's start at the bottom, where it talks about grounding and bonding. If I'm going to take something, you know, and install something like a transformer, and um, there's no connection between the primary and the secondary side, physically, is there? That connection is through electromagnetic induction. That's how the transformer works. But I'm going to have bonding jumpers installed, I'm going to have, uh, uh, I, I want to make sure that I bond all my non-current carrying metal parts uh, that could become energized during operation and so we keep everybody safe, so we bond our system. So sure enough, the frame of the transformer is bonded, the primary source is bonded to the frame of the transformer and the secondary and all of that, but it says that doesn't count, okay? That's not considered to be an electrical connection between those two different sources of supply. So, let's take a look at, well, in fact, I've got an example right up here behind me. I've got a little automatic transfer switch that we use in training. And the power would normally come in from the utility service, go through the contacts inside the transfer switch, and then go out from there down to the load for these bottom terminals. In the event of a loss of incoming power from the utility, it'll send, actually in most cases, it would send a signal to a generator, wouldn't it? The generator would start, come up on the line, and come up to speed. And when it is up to speed and ready to go, it would automatically close the output breaker on the generator. And then the transfer switch would throw on the inside and connect me to the generator breaker and supply my load with power. Now, the real question on that is whether or not I have a separately derived system. And the answer is, in this particular switch, it's a four-pole switch. There are four separate sets of contacts, one for each phase, A, B, and C. The question is, on the separately derived system, what do I do with the neutral? Okay, If I run the neutral, and there is a fourth pole, as I mentioned over here. I think I mentioned it. Okay? And so if I run the neutral conductor, the grounded conductor, through that transfer switch, then I'm switching from the utility grounded system over to my generator system. And so I better go over to that generator and I better put some ground rods down and I better connect a grounding electrode conductor from my generator windings to my grounding electrode system. Because now I have a separately derived system. We'll take a little bit better look at that. In fact, let's do this. Let's go ahead and we'll put some images up and we'll go through and we'll talk about uh, our transformers and generators, transfer switches, and so forth, and then we'll get into the code requirements. So let's take a look at a transformer, a good example, and probably the most common type of separately derived system we have out there in the field. Very typical, I've got a 480 volt supply disconnect over here on the left hand side, and I'm using to supply this transformer in the middle, three phase transformer. There's no physical connection, as we said, between the, the uh, windings. I've got the A phase primary, the A phase secondary, B phase primary, secondary, and so on for C phase. So we're relying on electromagnetic induction to step down the voltage in this case to 208 volt three phase power and supply these two panel boards on the right hand side. So since there is no physical connection between the sources of power themselves between the 480 volts and the 208 volts then we say it's a separately derived system. So now I have to install uh, a grounding electrode conductor. And I've got to install that somewhere between the transformer and my first disconnecting means. 
So we see those rules in Article 250. How do I install the transformer in a separately derived system? Go to Article 450. Article 450 is going to cover transformers, isn't it? And of course, all the rules of one chapters 1 through 4 would apply as well. So that's a very common way that our very common separately derived system then that we have. Here's another example. This is a transfer, automatic transfer switch in a commercial building. And so we're going to open it up and take a look on the inside. But we do have a, a little, little uh, control panel. Let's take a close-up view of that control panel then. If we were to look at that control panel, we have source 1 and source 2. Ah, two separate sources of power. Source 1 comes from my utility. Source 2 comes from my generator. So it must be a separately derived system. Oh, don't jump to conclusion, Jet, huh? Just because I have two separate sources of power doesn't mean that there isn't some type of connection between the two of them. We see on this, by the way, source 1, uh, the little red LED is lit up on it. It says that the power is available. Uh, the little green LED says it's connected and that my load is energized then. In the event of a loss of utility power, the generator gets a signal, starts, comes up to speed, and when it comes up to speed, this transfer and is ready to go, deliver power, then this transfer switch is automatically going to uh, shift power to that generator for me. So let's take a look on the inside of this transfer switch and see how it happens. We open the door and we take a look on the inside and we have two insulated case circuit breakers. The insulated case circuit breaker on the top is from my utility power, so I have utility power coming in. Brown, orange, and yellow must be 480 volts, right? Not required by the code that those be color coded that way, but that's pretty much industry standard. Down below I have another insulated case circuit breaker and it would probably be open right now, right, if I were uh, uh, in which we saw we are in a utility power and sure enough this breaker is closed and the breaker from the generator is open. And then my load comes off, there's some bus work in between the two breakers and that goes out and supplies my loads with power. Let's take a look then at the rules uh, for grounding and bonding. As we said, installing the equipment we just simply follow uh, the, the rules for the equipment. Chapters 1 through 4 and then whatever else applies and so forth. But when the real question becomes, if I'm not switching this neutral, if I no longer have a neutral, I've got to derive a new neutral. I kind of look at it as when I have a, a separately derived system, the rules start over again, at least for grounding and bonding. They're not the same as the service. I have to go to Article 250, Section 30. So 250.30 is on grounding separately derived alternating current systems. And that's going to tell me how to ground my separately derived system then. Alrighty? Now, 250.30 is divided up into three separate sections. Section A is for grounded systems and Section B is for ungrounded systems. Wait a minute, I thought we were grounding systems here, okay? Don't get confused. At the very beginning of 250.30 it tells me to be sure and apply 250.20 and 21, which are my systems that uh, if you go back and look at that, well, how, and how's it worded? Systems that are required to be grounded, systems that are permitted to be grounded, and then we have systems that we're not allowed to ground. Okay, so I have to follow those requirements, obviously. Most typically we're dealing with grounded systems, and so we're in subsection A here. But B addresses ungrounded systems. We'll talk about a little bit about what that has to say. And then finally, what if my, well, quite honestly, what well, it's typical, I got a big generator. My big generator is outside the building that I'm supplying uh, my separately derived system with. There are some special grounding rules that that source is outside the building and that's covered in subsection C then. So let's take a brief look, an overview then, uh, because we just simply, we don't have the time to get into all the details. There's another, you know, two hour class or whatever. So let's go through the, the 250.30A for grounded systems. And it says that there are eight requirements that you must comply with. So if you're going to have a grounded system and it's separately derived, eight things you've got to pay attention to. You have to have a system bonding jumper. You have to follow the rules for installation of a system bonding jumper. You have to have a supply side bonding jumper. A little terminology, right? The supply side bonding jumper as opposed to equipment grounding and bonding and all of that. Supply side means on the line side of the uh, disconnecting means or the overcurrent protection then. So we have supply side bonding jumpers to ensure 
that continuity or protection. Subsection 3 talks about the grounded conductor itself, and the grounding electrode is covered in section 4, subsection 4. How do we size the grounded conductor and so forth? We have to go to Article 250 and look up how we, well, in fact, how we supplies the system bonding jumper, the grounded conductors, and so forth. So you do want to take a look at 250.66 in particular would be a good one for you, that table on how we size our conductors then. Now, we have, uh, what if we only have one separately derived system? It's pretty simple. That's subsection 5 there. The grounding electrode conductor for a single separately derived system. Size our grounding electrode conductor connected from the source to the grounding electrode system. If I have multiple separately derived systems, it talks about how I can have a common grounding electrode, and then I tap along that common grounding electrode as I, I uh, need to with my multiple separately derived systems. Subsection 7 gets into the installation, and that refers me to 250.64. 250.64 tells me how to, to uh, install my grounding electrode conductor. And then finally bonding, and the reference in bonding in this particular subsection references us uh, to 250.104D. And what that's telling me is that I have to bond uh, in my, as part of my grounding electrode system, and that tells me that I'm not to bond to my water piping, uh, any exposed structural metal of the building, metal and steel and so forth. So anyway, that's covered in, what did I say, 250.104D. So, I have to pay attention to those if I have a grounded system. I have to adhere, I have to comply with all eight of those subsections. Now, what if I have an ungrounded system then? In that case, I still have to have a grounding electrode conductor, and once again, that's sized on table 250.66. And remember, that's where I size my conductors, like the grounding electrode conductor, based on the size of the derived phase conductors and so forth. So anyway, what do I do with this grounding electrode conductor? I'm not grounding my distribution system because it's an ungrounded system. What I'm doing is I'm connecting the metal enclosures of the separately derived system to a grounding electrode. That's the purpose of that grounding electrode conductor then. And also requires a supply side bonding jumper on the supply side of that disconnecting means over current protection. Alrighty, and then finally, what if I have an outdoor source? And I think we mentioned this, the, if the generator is outside the building that it's serving, then that's considered to be an outside source. So where do I have to ground that? I have to ground at the generator. It says if the source of the separately derived system is outside the building, make a grounding electrode connection at the source to one or more grounding electrodes. And really, that's in a nutshell, that's my rules for grounding and bonding a separately derived system. Now, if you haven't already, open your code book up to 250.30, and you're going to find lots of detailed information. You're going to find several exceptions under uh, many of those, or under several of those uh, subsections. So you want to always pay attention, of course, to the exceptions as well. Article 690 is on solar PV systems, right? And it's a separately derived system. I'm going to take DC power from this solar array and eventually I'm going to put it through this inverter and so I'm going to take and change the DC into AC, do that electronically and then take that AC out to my loads or the grid or wherever it is I'm going with it. So I have separately derived systems. So if I look in part 5 of article 690 I'm going to find five requirements for grounding and bonding of these PVC, uh, PVC, P, well no, PV systems, okay? Alrighty. So uh, 690.41 PV system, DC circuit grounding and protection. Dot 42 is the point of the PV system, DC circuit grounding connection, where to make it. Dot 43 is equipment grounding and bonding. Dot 45, sizing my equipment grounding conductors. And then dot 47 on the grounding electrode system. A couple of the references I'll mention uh, quickly for you. We talked a little bit about generators. If you are involved in, if that, you know, other source for you, that separately derived source is a generator, of course you want to go to Article 445 on generators for its installation. But also take a look in Chapter 7 under Special Conditions. 
we have emergency generation or emergency generators and uh, emergency generator systems and in, uh, article 700 legally required standby systems is 701 and 702 optional standby systems now your requirements for your emergency power systems then is that generator has to start come up to speed be on the line and delivering power within 10 seconds that's pretty good take something like a two megawatt generator driven by a big maybe 3,000 or so horsepower diesel engine it's a cold day outside supplying it with diesel fuel I better preheat that diesel fuel I better preheat that engine because it's got to go from ground zero to somewhere well under load within 10 seconds that's pretty impressive on a big engine like that isn't it now where do I use those systems where human life is important so lighting system in a high-rise building hospital emergency room those are examples you know simple examples I guess of of applications of emergency power so take a look at article 700 then 701 legally required standby systems hey human life is in a, at stake but it's very important that we get some power so we have one minute for that second source of power standby power system to come up to speed and be delivering power then so very important to us new technologies out there all over the place so pay attention to whatever type of system that you're installing as to what you're using for that emergency or standby source of power alrighty so anyway that is separately derived systems in a nutshell we looked at the definition for separately derived systems we looked at the most common applications and then we looked at the rules for grounding and bonding of these separately derived systems but only an overview get into your code book if you need any of the details and then finally we looked at a couple of additional references for you so anyway till the next tech talk work safely